Welcome to ESL Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. Today's episode is our YI special choice regarding citizen science. We will start, discuss the topic with three outstanding speakers. Thomas Mayer, clinical scientist and member of the Young Investigator Task Force. Marco Korenjak, president of the European Liver Patients Association. And Catherine Jack, chair of the nurse and AHP workforce and postdoc researcher. Welcome to you on board. Hi, Martha. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Thank all you. of you. So starting with this topic, uh, Tom, I would like to ask you, how do you define uh, public involvement or engagement in research? What is it about? Thanks, Marta. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this discussion. Um, and I think it's a really timely and important studio, particularly for young investigators. And it's great to be joined by such fantastic speakers. So, so patient and public involvement and engagement in research is something that we should all be familiar with. Patients uh, want it. Funders increasingly expect it. And it has such potential to widen the impact of our research. So, so what is patient and public involvement all about? Well, I think simplistically is when research is carried out with or by members of the public rather than performed on or about them. And, and there's an increasing move to see research as this kind of active partnership between researchers and patients, carers and members of the public. And to my mind, there are four kind of overarching reasons why patient involvement is so important. Firstly, it's democratic. So people who are affected by research have a right to be involved and have a say in it. Secondly, patients definitely provide a different perspective and typically offer personal knowledge and experience, which is relevant to our research topic. Thirdly, it improves quality and relevance of our research by ensuring that we focus on key questions that are important and meaningful to our target population. And lastly, we can't really shy away from it. Um, the fact that patient and public involvement represents a key priority for funders and for ethics committees. So from a practical perspective, in order we have to be able to fund and deliver our research, and this requires integration of patients. So patient involvement is democratic, broadens perspectives, improves quality, and helps get research off the ground. And I'm really hoping that we can touch on some or all of these points in our discussions today. Great. Well, that's a wonderful introduction, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so we also have uh, here representative of Patients Association, and, and also Catherine is really an expert involving patients in research. So I would like both of you to talk about um, any uh, evidence or personal experiences where patients' input significantly influence their research outcomes. Can you comment on that? Yeah, do you want me to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, go for it, Catherine. So when I, um, the research I did from, from a PhD was about understanding why people in prison don't want to be tested. So um, what I managed to do was get in contact with a service user forum, um, local in Nottingham, and all of the individuals there had been um, in and out of prison at various stages of their um, drug taking career. And they were able to give me some really candid advice about on two things really. Firstly, the survey that I was developing, they pointed out that my original version was far too long and people would just stick it in the bin without even bothering because it was so long. Um, and they explained that there was a few things that I needed to reword because literacy and, and understanding wasn't gonna be that great and, and different languages there. Um, they gave me some advice on how I could optimally capture as many people as possible for a survey. In the end, they suggested that I simply did, but it turned out to be a really big paper round of de developing um, or giving rather um, a thousand envelopes under a thousand doors on, during several evenings after they were locked up for the night. But importantly, they also helped me with the, the qualitative interview guide as well. And they would just say, oh no, if you ask people about this, they won't necessarily give you the answers, but if you change your question round, you'll get you'll get different responses. So they really did help me um, just to understand how I could best get the information that I needed. So it was invaluable. Right. So yeah, right. really nice. Yes, Michael. Yeah. 
Mm. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the question. Mm. So uh, when I was thinking about the answer, so I remembered a dinner I had uh, many years ago with Pierre Gines mm. in, in Boston. And he said, OK, let's involve patients in the research. This was one project at uh, European Research Horizon 2020. And I, I really didn't have a clue how patients can integrate into that. And we started like this collaboration on, on the notion that we want to do something and we want patients to be part of the research. And then and was, as we went along, it was clear that patients should not just be like at the end of the process where you are like finishing, you're doing like a clinical research and you need some, some sub subjects. But it's really beneficial if you try to put a patient representative at different points of, of your research. I think this is the, the, the thing that we need to address. Uh, mm -hmm. ELPA is now part of 20 such projects, and it, there is an increasing demand for, for patient participation in research. And this is a coin that has two sides. So on one side, we need patients that clearly understand how the research is going on and what are the phases and where do you need them. But on the other side, uh, also researchers need to be very aware where they should put the, the voice of the patient and what would be beneficial. So as we speak, there are not so many works that are done on uh, methodology, how to measure the impact of patients, because surely and clearly not every voice is important, but it needs to be on the right path, on the right side and, and the right, uh, uh, right voice. Uh, and this is easier to do if the researcher knows where he will be incorporating the patient voice. <laughs> and Marco, it, you say that you want to integrate patient voice at different key junctions in a large project. Are you are you selecting different patients to so certain group of patients for protocol development, certain group of patients for help with analysis, certain group of patients for help with dissemination, or is it the same patient group that you take the whole way through the journey of the study? So thanks for the question. So if we look uh, this as, as a problem, so you have many facets of this problem. So you have a patient that has experience of a, of a treatment or, a, or a, maybe a disease. Then you have a patient advocate. So when you are doing research, you need to be very clear. Do you want to see the broader picture or you want to incorporate someone uh, that works, for example, in patient uh, association and has regular meetings where he sees what the, re what the main problems are? Or is maybe more beneficial for your research that you have a person that has a specific disease. So we have uh, patients that have like a, a disease and they want to contribute. And then we have like patient advocate with or without the experience of the uh, disease. I think this is really, in I think this is really interesting, Marky, because as a researcher, if I'm trying to design a project, I look to think who are my best collaborators to contribute to different areas of the science. Whereas actually what, what you're explaining is you also are thinking what are the different type or, or groups of patients that I need to group to, that contribute different areas of expertise to a project, which kind of is a different perspective for us as YIs to think about a large research project. Yes, Thomas, you're right to the point. So you need to think about what exactly are you expecting from patient community, and then we can help you search for the right uh, patient to contribute to that, because you need the right person at the right for the right task. Sometimes you also need a patient that has some uh, medical background or, or a pharmacological education so that he will be able to contribute to the process. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that came to my mind. Uh, how do organizations like Kelpa works? How do you decide who should be the advocate, who should work with what researcher? So can you comment on that? How How is all elected? So at, at, at the moment, we work very closely with principal investigators at the beginning of the project. And we go through the signing of all the documents and everything. And we just explore where a patient contribution would be beneficial. And then when we have that on the table, then we go to the patient representatives that we have in our organization. 
So we represent around more than 30 patient associations from 25 countries. Altogether, there are around 100,000 patients and patient relatives and family members and volunteers that are in the process. So we go to that pool and we try to identify a patient that would have this criteria. So it's like, you know, exclusion, inclusion criteria, uh, mm. but for the patients. Mm. I didn't realize that you had um, that many countries involved, you know, with, with ELPA and that you had that, you know, that extent of resource. Um, I suspect, you know, that's a fairly untapped resource. I think that there's a lot of us in the research world that would be really keen to engage even even more with you and your colleagues. Um, so, so yeah. thank you, Catherine. I, <laughs> I, I think, think you will get more work. <laughs> I, I think it's a policy of open door and, and mm. I, uh, patients want to contribute, but we are really working hard to educate them. So, for example, Catholic University from Rome had the first master's degree in patient advocacy last year. So it was the first yeah. time that a formal education was uh, offered to, to patient representatives. And then you have Eupati training, which is a specific training in uh, development of drugs and medical devices. So these are very beneficial points that you need to, to learn if you really want to meaningful contribute to the research, because it's, it's clear as a day. You can have a patient and then you have a patient. So one patient mm -hmm. will drag you down and will slow the process. And if you are talking about the funders of the research, they are also looking at the timeframes. So you mm -hmm. cannot afford to have a wrong patient for the wrong task because it's going to take longer. And, and then you mm -hmm. have other problems. But that's why we, we have an open door policy and we try to find the best resource that, that we can. Gosh. Okay. Great. <laughs> so I have another question for all of you. Um, do you consider that any type of research is suitable for including the patient's perspective? Um, what do you think about basic or translational science? So I'm, I'm a clinician scientist, Marta. I know. But I'm but not. I feel, but you're yeah. not. And I feel, I feel obliged to try and um, tap into our basic science community within the YI um, community at Easel. Uh, and I do work with lots of basic sciences. I think traditionally it's been felt that integrating patient involvement within basic research has been more challenging. Um, or actually often, I think, talking to colleagues, there's been very good patient involvement, but is often reported less. Um, um, and I can kind of understand this because in some ways, basic science feels less close to patients, but ultimately laboratory science is being conducted to have an impact on patients and their families. And I don't know what the group think, but I think that basic scientists should draw lots of confidence and inspiration from work performed during the pandemic. So, for example, in this setting, mm -hmm. basic immunology rapidly led to COVID treatments that had an unprecedented global impact. Um, and, and the world will be forever grateful to basic scientists in, in this setting. But I do think that more generally, the public do, do recognise the power and importance of basic research. And I think the connection is actually a lot closer than you think. And maybe we just need to continue to try and formally, more formally bridge the gap between the lab and lived experience. Yeah, and it, it is interesting. I was just gonna chip in and say, I know um, going back to when, when treatments for hepatitis C were first licensed and um, we were giving, um, to a, a group of people with decompensated liver disease for the first time and so we had some patients who were had had a really distressing history and they were quite anxious about taking a brand new drug you know just to see if it worked but it did work and there were a number of them cured and the emotion that was expressed and the gratitude for the scientists was phenomenal and it's just a shame in a way that the scientists never got to hear that because they don't hear I don't have that patient experience, but I definitely remember one lady who was very tearful with emotion and she just said, oh, bless those scientists. They didn't give up on people like me. And that's just a really powerful message. And I would hope that any, any of you basic scientist researchers that are tapping in and listening to this would take heart and encouragement from that message because the patients really, really value all the work that's done. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I think the real time um, feedback is so important. So 
these yeah. participants yeah. involved in studies or receiving drugs. So, so, for example, patients that are involved in clinical or translational studies, we're, we're, we're really trying to write thank you letters for their involvement. I also now routinely try and send them a copy of the main publication with the lay summary mm -hmm. because it's tangible output and tangible, you know, they like to feel that they, well, they have contributed to medical science. Um, and then also holding online meetings we're doing increasingly to feed back results to participants and to thank them and to get feedback. So I think that that real time personal feedback of results is crucial. And that can be on a massive level with a big PPI kind of communication program, or it can be on a small level with here's a thank you letter and a copy of the publication. But I think all of it is involved mm -hmm. in trying to connect clinicians and scientists to patients. I I can just echo that. And everything that was said is is to the point. So um, it is good if you receive something in return. Several times it happens that you are involved in yeah. research and, and then, you know, you go on, you are publishing papers and, and you do your work because you need to do your work. But it's great to have at least something. An email is, is sometimes already enough. Yeah. Um, what did you think about... Um popular science activities. Do you think that could help in this regard? Say that again, Marta. Science activities. Popular science. I mean, like um, uh, speaking in uh, schools and this kind of activities, I, for example, in Spain are increasingly done by researchers. Mm. So what do you think about this kind of activities that can help in this regard you are commenting on? Or do you think that's too broad, so may not help the the research. I think and maybe I'll come in. I think I think a lot of what we I think it's a really important point. A lot of what we talked about so far, Marta, has been how we can use patients to inform our specific research question. But then mm -hmm. there's a much broader thing. There's a much mm -hmm. broader concept of engagement that doesn't have to be spe question specific. Does it doesn't have to be research focused, but can be focused on healthy lifestyles and alcohol and, you know, the plight of hepatology across the world. And I know Easel doing lots of outreach incentives in, in that direction. Uh, and the LPA are doing lots of incentives, which I'll cut to Marco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted to chip in and, you know, easel in London, when there was a conference in London, they went to schools and also mm -hmm. uh, they went also to medical schools to, to show what this is all about and why people should, sh should start study hepatology. So I think that was a step in the right direction because also... Absolutely. On the lower level in, in schools, children need to learn about internal organs and also about the liver, which is hugely important, but usually we don't know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there are, there are future young investigators. Ah. Yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> for <so> sure. Crucial. <laughs> and what, are, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, with evolving patients in research? Oh, I think one of the biggest challenges, if I may start this bit, is, is actually encouraging some people to come forward, particularly if it's um, a condition that's more stigmatised. So I've um, been part of a, a wider liver research community and we've been trying really hard to engage people with hepatitis B virus to get involved as, as PPI. And it's been really hard because people will often engage on a one-to-one -one basis or respond to an email, but to encourage people to get together in a group um, and, and have that group um, discussion has been very, really difficult. There's been um, some work that we've done with uh, the British Liver Trust charity and, and some senior hepatologists who've got some, some work as part of an NIHR liver partnership grant to, to create a, a new research group for PPI involvement for hepatitis B. And it's We've had a couple of meetings and it's really taken off very well. And it's meant that the patients have been able to really help to shape the research question and, you know, help us decide what direction is the most, you know, most important to go down. Um, it's having a good relationship, I think, with the patients so that they trust you and then we'll come forward and, and sit with you. Mm. So if I may... Uh, yeah. Um... Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> no, no, you go, you go. So um, I, I think the first step is definitely to find the patients that would be willing to participate. Uh, when Easel had a conference in Vienna, I, I think that I addressed uh, the, the, the 
all the researchers and saying that, you know, you are the one who are seeing patients. You are the mm -hmm. one who can see if someone would be really perfect fit for having a, a patient uh, advocacy or, or patient association. And, and you try to motivate him and, and link him because that is something that happened to me. So I had nothing to do with hepatology, but when I went to the treatment for hepatitis C, in the process of the treatment, we develop a really good relationship with my doctor. And at the end of the process, she said, you know, it would be really beneficial if in Slovenia, we would also have a patient association. And this was the first step. But this is, of course, because you ask for the obstacles, this is, of course, just the first step. So finding patients, you need to be aware that we have two groups of patients. So we have chronically ill and we have acute illnesses. So the people with acute illnesses, 95% will come to the healthcare facilities and just go out. They just want to be cured. They don't want to hear about the research, about the phases, about the clean, nothing. So they just want to be fixed and go home and do their stuff. But then you have a small group of patients that are maybe chronically ill or have some kind of other condition, and maybe they have an interest to be in the field. So it's really important to like build up a, a fabric of network that would catch such a patient that would be interested in participation. And then when we catch them, we can educate them. We can show them how to participate meaningfully and, and with impact. I, I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a, a fantastic summary. And I think... Both Catherine and Marco mentioned the first uh, mentioned a couple of words, which are first steps. And, and I think for young investigators, it's about taking those first steps that are really important. Um, and so I think the first thing is you've got to involve patients and public in research. So don't fight it or be scared of it. You've just got to make the effort. Um, the second thing is, I would say is that um, look around. Are there any PPIE schemes or groups locally that you can tap into? And often I found that one of my colleagues has already done the groundwork for me. Um, the next step, practically, I would suggest is are there local or national charities that you can access patients through? Um, and then otherwise, can you set something up like Marco says? Can you approach patients and start to get some momentum to set up a network? And I think it's worth mentioning at this stage that patient involvement very rarely needs ethical approval. So there may be local policies and best practices about approaching patients or remunerating patients, but actually there shouldn't be ethics approvals or long drawn out regulatory requirements. So I think mm -hmm. for young investigators, you've just got to make the step, make the leap and make the connections with patients to help them inform your research. Does that seem fair? Marco? Can I, can I, it was an excellent addition. Can I just add one thing that we are like, we're working very strongly for. So yeah. it would be great if the, in the habilitation process, working with patients would be also graded. And, and you will have like, if you have two papers and one paper was just with scientists and the other was with some kind of a patient involvement. So the rating of the patient of the papers should be a little bit different. So maybe in the future for all the young investigators, it will be also mandatory to involve patients in some phases. So we are trying, pushing very hard to, to involve this into the habilitation processes where you want to be a professor or something that you need to like work with patients. But of course, this is two sides of one coin. On the other side, we need to be prepared for that. We, we, we need to prepare patients to collaborate with, with young researchers. Yeah, I think yes. I think grading of grants, it, I think I think it's being scored in grant proposals, Marco, your involvement with with people, with, with with patients. But I don't think it's yet mm. in the publication process, is it? And it, it may it may be coming that we're peer reviewed on the ability of our study and collaborators to engage with patients. Sorry, did I interrupt someone, Marta? No, no, I was just uh, thinking that um uh, like Marco said, educating the uh, patients to be able to have the knowledge and the skills to uh, meaningful uh, to, to make an impact on research is is difficult and it's time consuming. So I think it will be very difficult to find people uh, wanting or that want to um, take those the, all that time to be educated and to uh, make these uh, approaches. So uh, probably it will take money also to, to achieve this, um, this aim. Yeah, money is the elephant in the room, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I think 
I think patients by and large are, are willing, they want to give back and they're willing to be involved. Um, but, but to build a comprehensive patient engagement program and to adequately remunerate them for their time costs money. And, and so you're absolutely right, Marta, when we're writing a grant, we should be writing in funds to, you know, set up, set up the infrastructure to, to properly integrate patients. And Marco and Catherine may be able to comment more on that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's interesting. It's a chicken and egg situation because when you write a grant application, there's, there'll always be a section that says, words to the effect of what PPI engagement have you had already? What have you done? But then you haven't got the money in the first place from the grant in order to do that activity. So it's about being creative to understand where you can access small pots of money to get some PPI work initially. And it could be that the hospital you work in has a, a charity that you could apply for for funds to, to do that. And it would simply be room hire, um, refreshments, paying the individuals. Um, Amazon vouchers goes down quite well um, and people's transport and parking if necessary. Um, and that would initially get you off the ground. Um, or it could be that some of the senior hepatology researchers who you work with um, have got some underspend from another study that they will be willing to work with you and say yes you can have those you know there's a few hundred quid left there a few hundred euros you can have that for to support some ppi activity to get your work off the ground and then you still cost in the ppi work in your own study but it means you've got some money that you can then bring forward the next piece of research that you do and marco you, mm. i think you've yeah. talked you've talked a little bit marco about training your patients to in order to meaningfully um, contribute it, um are there are there online resources freely available on line resources for patients to tap into in terms of training them or is it is that quite an expensive and involved process that's curated by e elpa so um we have several possibilities so yeah. if you are a member of a patient association, the patient association will have a resources to, to train uh, its members. For example, British Liver Trust is a proud member also of ELPA, and, and we are providing them with some education. And many times also the members are providing education for other members. So mm -hmm. we are just the link there. And then you have, for example, a patty training in um, drug development is online, is for free for everyone. Uh, if you want a certificate to show that you did something, the certificate and then uh, the price of the certificate is very low and the education is very high level. So uh, you have resources that, that you can tap in in order to educate yourself in, in these endeavors. Mm. Great, yeah. that sounds really good. Uh, so, see, yeah. Yeah, Michael. but I, I just wanted to add something about the research. So because, yeah. I mean, I, I know more about the research that is fin financed by European Commission because we are part mm. of the Horizon projects. And several of projects were rejected because they involve patients, but no budget was set aside for the activities. So it, it, it looked like that everything that has to do with patients was based on voluntary basis. So this is a good thing and you will have some things that are based on voluntary basis, but it cannot be solely on voluntary basis because then you are showing the, the funders that you can also do without that. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it is great if you can uh, manage to find or set aside something that would be used for patient participation. And uh, as Catherine said, people are really, really uh, happy if they receive, for example, a free parking place or, uh, I don't know, something to drink when they uh, participate in their own free time to, to mm -hmm. further your research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's also nice, like working in a volunteer bas basis, but giving some rewards. So because doing that. And I think that has been really a nice discussion. Um, to sum up, could it's one of you um, select one take home message that our audience should not forget? Who wants to kick off? So if maybe I can start, you know. Yeah. Let the all the guys start. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really envision or I, I see the future in a way that um, a patient advocacy would be a career choice. 
So now we have the situation that people are volunteering their time. They work with patient groups. We have no specific uh, working group that would be a patient advocacy. Last year, we started with the first formal program of educating patient advocates. So maybe somewhere in the future, a young mind of a young people will have the idea to choose the profession of being a patient advocate. And this would mm. be like a paid profession and they would do it professionally, not just based on a voluntary basis. This, this is my hope for the future. Yeah, I can definitely see how that would work in our hospital, actually. You've got me thinking about role creation. I think for me, the, the take home message is to um, is to just do it. And just going back to what you were saying at the beginning is that research should be not just done to people, but with them and to build it in right from the get go and add, add, add it into your grant applications generously. Mm. Yeah, I echo both of those um, thoughts. I, from my so, from my perspective as a young investigator, and on behalf of the young investigators, I think that it's a mindset thing where we need to make it really automatic that we see research as a continuous two way conversation between patients and researchers. Um, and we spend so long in the lab, and we spend so long on the wards that we need to make sure that all of our efforts are worth it by guaranteeing that we ask the right questions and reach the right people. So thank you so much, all of you. I think this has been really interesting for the eyes, but also for the wider audience. Um, so next week, uh, join us for the replay of our episode on the limitations of the DCLC system and discussing an innovative new treatment algorithm. Remember to become a member and join the ECL family. Bye.